Hi, this is Kelly with Two Broads Talking Politics. This is the fourth episode of our Democratic Presidential Candidate Book Club series. You can find all the episodes in this series at twobroadstalkingpolitics.com slash book club. Or you can find these episodes in our regular feed anywhere podcasts are found. Hey everybody, this is Kelly with Two Broads Talking Politics here for our fourth episode in our book club series. Joining me is my co-host Sophie. Hey Sophie. Hey. We're joined once again by freelance writer Kaz Wida. Hi Kaz. Hello. And by writer and actress Elizabeth Thorpe. Hi Elizabeth. Hi ladies, how are you? Great. So today we are talking about Julian Castro's book, An Unlikely Journey. So this is, as I mentioned, the fourth of these presidential candidate books that we're reading. You can find the other three books on our website, our discussions about those. Uh, And we're going to keep going for as long as these lovely ladies will keep joining me (laughs) in Uh reading books. So let's just start with kind of overall impressions. What did you all think of this book? Sophie, lead us in. I didn't get through all the book. It was good. It was interesting. I just didn't think it was like that interesting, I guess. (laughs) I guess I feel like after we've like read all of these memoirs, it's starting to feel like a pattern, you know, like people are talking Mm -hmm. about, you know, here's how I went from being a normal person, an average person to being a politician. And here's my bootstrap story. And, you know, Mm -hmm. it seems pretty, it was, it was interesting, but I didn't quite finish it because I, I kind of am getting a little tired of the formula, I guess. Kaz, what did you think? Well, I think in terms of bootstrap stories, this is a pretty good one. I mean, we're talking about a young man who was raised by a single mom. And unlike, you know, I think of Kamala's story a lot when I, when I read this book, mm-hmm. Kamala's mom was pretty well off because she had the skills to have a fairly high paying job. And so I don't know that they had to struggle in the same way. So this, I I felt that the story um, out of the books that we've read so far, and certainly what I know about other presidential candidates is really sort of a, how to come from a pretty disadvantaged background and really make something of yourself. I mean, he and his brother's story are are very remarkable um, in that way, at least. Mm Mm-hmm. When I, this is Elizabeth, when I started reading it, you know, like I think a lot of people had compared it to Obama's dreams from my father, and Mm -hmm. I didn't find it nearly as well written or interesting. (laughs) I mean, Sophie, I agree with you, kind of the same formula of like how I grew up under duress and tough circumstances and a poverty stricken neighborhood. And, um, I, you know, I love a good American dream story. And he certainly is. He and his brother are both that way. But it did feel formulaic to me. And it also, there's uh, dreams from my father are, is really, I think, Barack Obama's voice and was very, you know, personal to him. And he put a lot of energy into that. And I think um, this kind of felt like maybe it was put together, you know, for the 2020 election season. It's interesting that you mentioned Dreams from My Father because I had heard the same thing and I think that's maybe why I found it a little disappointing because I had been expecting mm-hmm. Dreams from My Father because so many people had compared them. But I think I said this in a previous book club taping. I Dreams from My Father is like such a great book that it's really hard to go in thinking right. that you're going to get that book because, you know, I don't think I've read a political or a, a politician's memoir quite like mm-hmm. that book. So. I think having heard that myself as well, I think it set me up for unrealistic expectations, maybe. Right. And I don't remember the exact timing of Dreams from My Father, but that wasn't like a prepping to run for president. No, he was still in the Senate. Yeah. I don't think so. It might have been Senate, but I don't think it was. Yeah, he was in the Senate. It was. Yep. So all four of these books that we've recently read were 
sort of explicitly written as, and now I'm preparing to run for president. <laughs> mm-hmm. So it may be a little bit why they feel somewhat formulaic. I mean, I, I will say what was interesting about this book for me was how much of it he spent on early childhood. You know, it was, it was really like half of the book. Yeah. I mean, it was I like a like. lot of like, and then we were in third grade <laughs> right. and, you know, a, a lot more than a lot, lot more of sort of the early childhood than we got in the previous three books that we read, you know, and a lot less really on the the things that he's done recently to to stand out and to be ready uh, to run for president, which in some ways actually made it really interesting to read for me, but wasn't maybe as good at telling me, would this person be a good president? I think, too, you know, it makes sense as identical twins who've had very similar careers that that he includes his brother, Joaquin, in so much of this book. But it was a lot. Like, at, at some point, you start thinking, are we really just electing twins to the presidency? <laughs> like, they seem completely tied together in ways that, you know, is really admirable and great. But, you know, on the other hand, it's kind of hard to distinguish the two sometimes, even reading one of them writing a book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I did enjoy, you know, the mother's influence and the grandmother's life stories and, and, you know, how she was the activist into public service that inspired the boys, the twins. But at the end of the book, I'm still wondering, does he have the policy chops? Like, where's the meat? (laughs) Besides emphasizing the role of education and, and opportunity in America, uh, I, I just didn't get a lot of there there. You know, it was, I, I, my impression is mostly about his difficult upbringing, and then you know success, his successes at Star, you know Stanford and Harvard, and you know then forward to the Obama administration and a cabinet level position. But I'd like to hear more about the policy stuff. Yeah, I agree. And I wonder if my reaction would have been different if I'd read this book before we read Elizabeth Warren's book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like Elizabeth Warren's book was so good with policy stuff that it's actually one of the things, many things did this, but the sort of the push me over the edge to sort of supporting her as a presidential candidate. I told Kelly recently, I just bought my Elizabeth Warren t-shirt yesterday. I'm very excited about it. <laughs> but I'm like wondering if I would have been like more into the story of his life if I'd read that this book first and not been expecting the same sort of policy chops as Elizabeth Warren's book. Mm-hmm. It's also true that he's very young. So I always keep that in mind when I think about this book and about, you know, what we hear most about his life because he doesn't have the same sort of, um, depth of experience, I guess, to draw from Mm -hmm. um, that some of the other folks that we've read have. Although he's older than Buttigieg. (laughs) That's true. Well, that's true. All right. So what are some of our favorite moments in the book? Kaz, you were telling me and Elizabeth about, you know, sort of being grateful to read about his mom not worrying too much about how much TV they watched. (laughs) Yeah, I think. I think his mom is probably my favorite character in this whole book. Like I would have been happy to read a book just written by her. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I thought she was kind of amazing. And I understand she had a lot of help, right? So we've got the grandma here who's probably doing quite a lot of the the cooking and the sort of day-to-day care taking activities. And that kind of freed mom up to really just encourage the twins and let them go. Mm -hmm. But I was impressed by how hard she fought to make sure they had the right opportunities and how intentional she was about their education. There's a couple of different points in the book where he talks about, oh, you know, we went to this school and my mom had to fight really hard to get us into this other school. And it seemed like they're hopping around schools, you know, every other year, but his mom always had a really good reason. And she Mm -hmm. was trying to leverage them into better opportunities. And I, I was consistently impressed with, how hard she worked to make sure that they were not at a disadvantage uh, for what they wanted to do. 
my kids were fighting yesterday. So I have two boys who are not twins, um, but they were they were fighting yesterday and, you know, getting almost a little physical at fighting. And I turned to my husband and I said, well, you know, Julian and Joaquin were constantly like fist fighting and stuff. I know, they up used and, to really beat each other Yeah, and, and they turned out great. So maybe we should just let the kids fight. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was interesting that they admitted that too, or that he admitted it. Yeah, I've... I really liked all the the stuff about, you know, how they would compete against each other, but then support each other. And it just seemed like such an amazing relationship to have with a sibling, you know, to grow up with that and and go that far away to college and know you've got someone there with you. And, you know, so I I really appreciated the the sibling story. Uh, I'll tell you what I could have done without. (laughs) I could have done without the, like, lengthy description about his cystic acne <laughs> when he arrived in Stanford. Like, it's just too much. <laughs> and I don't know if he's trying to be like, hey, I'm a regular guy, just like everybody else. But it was just, it felt so weird, awkward, icky. I, I just thought that was so weird. I mean, it's several paragraphs long, too. Yeah. And like, have people making quotes about it. It's just, it's, it's, it's bizarre. Are there, we talked about policy being something we'd like to have seen more. Are there other things we would have liked to have seen more of in the book? I mean, I would have liked to hear more about him as a parent. You know, I thought because so much of the book was focusing on him as the child, you know, and, mm-hmm. and his mom as the parent, which was very interesting. But, you know, we got some toward the end of, you know, sort of him being the the parent of these two kids. But, I, you know, that felt sort of just got a little bit of a short shrift. And I would have loved to, to see more of that because it, it seems like he's a really good dad from the little bit that we got. Well, what's interesting is that his, his dad was not very present in his life after a certain point. Mm-hmm. And so I would think that that role would be particularly inspirational for him to be able to be a father and to really be there for his kids in a more realistic fashion. Mm -hmm. But again, I don't know. I think when his daughter was born, he was pretty busy, right? Wasn't he, wasn't he just starting his career in Congress? So it may be that he actually isn't very present in her life just because of work. I think there's something having lived with my husband who has maybe ambivalent or negative feelings about the parenting he received as a child. I think there can be something very painful about parenting when you didn't have that example of what a good parent is. And so it might be that he just isn't really willing to bring that particular pain into sort of the spotlight because it can be very exhausting and confusing Mm -hmm. for people who didn't have that example growing up. Mm -hmm. I will say I appreciated how honest he was about his relationship with his father and that he didn't try to sugarcoat that in any way. There were probably a lot of ways he could have been vague about it and worked around it, but right. he was really upfront in this book about what happened with his dad yeah. and why he ended up being raised the way that he was. And there, he does it without making it seem like he's angry about it. Mm-hmm. Um, it just is what it is. And I, 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 I appreciated that about his attitude. Right. If only Pete B had addressed his coming out and his marriage like with the same candor. Mm-hmm. Do we think that we understand things about what kind of president Julian would be after having read this book? I mean, I feel like he's the the candidate that I sort of knew the least amount about going mm-hmm. into reading the book. And so I certainly have a better sense of him as a person. I'm not certain whether I have a better sense of what kind of president he would be. But I don't know how you guys feel about that. I, I agree with that. I think, I again, I also didn't have a great idea of who Kesher was before I read this book. Mm-hmm. I knew a little bit about him just because he's been sort of a rising star in the Democratic Party for the past few years, but I didn't really know that much about him. And now I feel like I know more about the place he's coming from and the the types of perspectives that he would be likely to understand but I don't know that much about what he actually wants to do as president, I guess. Mm -hmm. So I know more than I did. I don't know as much as I would like. I felt like I kind of knew more about him when his name was tossed around in 2016 as possible running mate for Hillary 
than I do now. <laughs> I know that's weird. I mean, I did have a sense of what kind of president Kamala, Elizabeth, and Pete would be, but I'm like, there was no, it, it wasn't wrapped up with a bow on it for me at the end. And certainly you get the impression he'd be very hardworking and ambitious, but I didn't, you know, even if he had added some meat to this book about what was important to him as mayor, he he did talk a lot about education and about how his right. wife really helped him um, pilot that specific program whose name escapes me, but he didn't he didn't really touch upon anything else that he did during his tenure or other things that were important to him or struggles or challenges that he had, or even times when he failed. Mm -hmm. I will say that about Mayor Pete's book. I appreciated when he talked about when he did something wrong and why it failed and what he learned from right. it. Right. And we didn't get any of that here. So I think, I know he would work hard, <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know how he would handle things. For instance, um, you know, just immigration policy, even just as a, a right. starting point, I would think that he could be pretty upfront and forward about what his perspective is on that. And he didn't really articulate that in this book at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, yeah, I wonder if, because it came out last fall, obviously he knew he was going to run, but it's just interesting how they left, how he left it kind of vague, because does he just think that He's just going to articulate this when he announces or on his website or through social media and speeches. It's, uh, it is interesting that there's not more specifically laid out, either failed as this is what I'd like America to do better or, you know, a way I think I can help this country is X, Y, Z. I mean, maybe this is part of the reason that he's kind of lagging in the polls. Yeah, you know, it's interesting when you said, was he going to spell that out on his website? I spend a lot of time looking at candidate websites. And uh, so I've been on his and he does not have an issues section of the website, oh. which I, <laughs> this is not the only candidate like this. Uh, he's not alone in this, but I really want them to just have an issue section where they're like, this right. is how I feel about this. This is how I feel about this. And it's, it's not there. I mean, it, you know, there's some sense of kind of what the priorities would be with education and immigration, but, uh, you know, that's not... That's not front and center, sort of what he feels on each issue. Uh, you know, I think we do, at least I got the sense uh, that he would be a, a pretty compassionate, thoughtful president. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he seems to to think deeply about the things that affect him, about, you know, how his life circumstances have changed him. Uh, there's that great moment when they're in law school at Harvard and they start this program uh, for kids who have never, you know, don't know any lawyers in their life uh, to be mentored mm -hmm. by kids who are in law school, you know, to, to have that nice relationship. And so, you know, I, I think he thinks really deeply and wants to help people. So I, you know, obviously, I think he'd be a good president in those ways. I think it's mostly the, you know, really laying out policy and stances that, that seems to be missing. Right. Yeah, all I know is education. You know, the education is important. That's it. The other thing we don't get that much of uh, is kind of how he'd be as a, a boss, you know, which is obviously an important piece of being a president. We got that in Kamala's book, certainly. Uh, we got that in Mayor Pete's book. Uh, probably not as much in Elizabeth Warren's book, but it was so policy heavy. But, you know, that doesn't really seem there's not a whole lot of like, this is what staff meetings were like when I was a mayor, you know, that that would have been really interesting. Yeah, he doesn't even talk about campaigning that much. There, there's some discussion about how the community and his family really pulled together and supported him and, and hit the pavement for him um, in some of the campaigns that he did. But there's not a lot of talk beyond the scope of those sort of immediate intimate relationships about how he interacted with people and um, folks that he worked closely with beyond his, beyond his family. Um, I don't right. recall, and maybe I just glossed it over my brain, but I don't recall him mentioning anyone specifically by name that um, has really been a consistent person in his life beyond his family and his, his wife. 
All right. So beyond Elizabeth's not wanting the the story of the acne, <laughs> are there any other things that we really didn't like about the book? You know, that clearly there's some stuff we feel was missing, but uh, was there anything we didn't particularly like? I mean, I think the, our silence, our collective silence, just goes back to the mess. I mean, it, <laughs> it, 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 it doesn't knock anybody's socks off. Yeah. Like, it's so... It's so bland that nothing really offends us either. You know, I mean, I think if if I were the editor for this book, I might have said, you know, the the growing up stuff is is sort of this rich tapestry, and it's. I was really into it during that part of the book, and mm-hmm. a lot of the sort of, and. Then I was on city council, and then I became a mayor, and then I, you know, was leading HUD. That stuff just felt like eh, I got to talk about this stuff. I mean, I, I almost feel like it would have been a better book if he had just focused on his childhood <laughs> and not added that stuff at the end. Right. You know, I mean, especially the the HUD part rattling it, off his resume. Yeah, I mean, it felt kind of name droppy when he was like, "Well, you know, Barack Obama called me a couple times, and you know, and then Hillary was." thinking about me for VP. And, you know, it's like, I I don't know, is that stuff really necessary? We know that part of his resume. If you're picking up the book, you probably know that part. Right. He could also have done that. There's a certain um, approach where you can take some of those really interesting, rich stories from your childhood and you can thread those through some of those stories through to show them as inspirations or examples of um, a belief that you have or value that you have that somehow translates into policy. Kamala's book was a little bit like that. And and Elizabeth Warren did that a few times as well, too, I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I don't think it had to be organized the way that it was. It was very chronologically organized. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like when he got to the end, he was like, all right, let's just finish this. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Right. and I, I think to speak to your point, you know, as an editor, what I might have done is said, hey, this is a great story. So how does this connect to other parts of your life? And let's make that the basis of this chapter rather than just telling this in a chronological way. That probably would have worked better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And, you know, I think part of this might be just uh, these people must have so little time to work on these books. You know, like writing books is not what they do for a living. It's a necessary prerequisite at this point to running for office, running for president. And, you know, I, a lot of it feels very much like some editor told you you have to get these points in. And so you like go home every night and write it down. <laughs> right. Or just you're interviewed by somebody and they ghostwrite it for you. Well, right. <laughs> yeah. You know, Elizabeth Warren clearly knows how to write a book. Right. This was not her first book. She's written lots of books. She understands it. She gets how to pull the audience in. And, uh, you know, it that it didn't feel as compelling as that. Agreed. All right. Do you think after having read this, uh, does Julian move up or down or stay around the same place on your list of candidates? I mean, he was pretty close to the bottom before. (laughs) I mean, he's down there with Bernie for me, and he remains down there with Bernie for me. Do I think he's an excellent public servant and very smart and motivated and um, compassionate? Yes. Do I think he's uh, president material? No. I think he doesn't move up or down for me. He was sort of somewhere, I have like three tiers of like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be so excited and happy if some of these people get in. And then I have sort of the middle tier where I'm like, yeah, these people will be fine. And then I have the bottom tier where I'm like, I guess. <laughs> and Julian Castro has always been in the middle tier. And I think he stays in the middle tier for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I have a similar, I have a similar perspective on it. I, 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 I don't, I guess I don't think a lot about him. He's just not even on my radar. And Unfortunately, that's probably a factor not just of who he is, but also of the kind of press coverage Mm -hmm. that he gets, which is pretty much zero. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, not necessarily really his fault. But I think also he's he's just got a lot of other things that he probably needs to do to um, round out his experience and to really put him in a better position to be a, a solid candidate for president or even, you know, let's say he wants to run for Senate. I'm not sure. He could probably um, really solidify his reputation and get there, but he needs to get some more experience. 
So yeah, I think you know he's probably middle tier for me. He's probably near the top of the middle tier just because what I do know of his policies, I like a lot. Uh, but yeah, not not like super exciting. And I agree, we're just not hearing that much about him. Definitely, and you know, at, perhaps this book is sort of a a reflection of why he's he's not. The kind of super compelling character that that some of these others are, but you know, I, I think he'd be really great. I I did spend some time wondering at the end of the book, would things have been different if Hillary had chosen him? You know, the mm-hmm. the race was just so close that it you know anything could have tipped things one way or another, right. and so it could be it could be that if she had chosen him, that would have been enough, or who knows, <laughs> Russia would have just stolen the right. election by more. <laughs> Anything could have right. happened, but but it is sort of an interesting uh, hypothetical. Yeah, I just I, I feel like there's zero charisma, mm-hmm. and when you're a leader, a world leader at that level, I mean, you have to have some sort of charisma. I mean, even Donald Trump has his wacky, you know, dysfunctional reality TV charisma because he looks like you know a cartoon, but. I, I just think either he's holding back and we can't see his real personality or he's, he just doesn't have that thing, that charisma that draws people, you know, to wanting to know more. Mm-hmm. All right. Is there anything else we want to make sure we talk about? Well, I was just wondering if he was president, you know, like, would he have his brother be in his cabinet? They like go everywhere together. I know. <laughs> I was. That's, I was wondering, I was like, I, I, I wonder was, how this would work. I was thinking a lot of like Jack and Bobby Kennedy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> would his brother yeah, be totally. his attorney general? I, I mean, I, I I wonder after Trump if people are going to be like, eh, whatever, nepotism's fine. <laughs> we don't care anymore. Or if it's going to be like, no, we have to go very hardcore back to being super ethical. Who knows? I mean, <laughs> fascinating. We'll see. One of the things I am enjoying, though, in a lot of these books and in the 2020 field is how many um, of the presidential candidates are really talking about how influential being raised by single moms was. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kamala's Mm -hmm. mom is front and center in her life and in in her motivation for seeking higher office. And I think Julian would stay the same. And so I I am enjoying. that I think it's a, a different perspective than we've gotten in the past um, from candidates who normally come from fairly traditional affluent backgrounds. So I agree. All right. Well, I think that wraps up our discussion of Julian Castro's book. As I mentioned, we've already reviewed three other books, so you can check out those reviews and uh We'll keep going in some form or another for a while, even if it's just me talking at a microphone (laughs) because everyone else gives (laughs) up on me. (laughs) Not yet. (laughs) So stay tuned for that. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Two Broads Talking Politics. Our theme song is called Are You Listening? off of the album Elephant Shaped Trees by the band Immunuri, and we're using it with permission of the band. Our logo and other original artwork is by Matthew Wethlin and was created for use by this podcast.